guys for coming out. Amazing to see that there's standing room only. Thank you guys so much. And second of all, thank you to Chris, who should be sitting at the back of the room, but he goes unnoticed, and he's doing an amazing job screaming the lecture to people who can't be here tonight. So today, I'm going to be talking to you about verb plays, about how they were portrayed in art and literature, and our perceptions of the verb plays. So Greek iconography and literature will be the main focus of my lecture tonight, but I do concentrate a little bit on the preserved examples. Um, I do have some replicas with me, they're hidden away, but after the lecture, after the question, please do come up and you can see what it actually feels like to handle the replicas, to see how the curved stories feel. So, I'm going to be concentrating on two main points tonight. The idea that terminology and language can shape our conceptions of the curved blades, and secondly, the misconception that these stories were Persian. So, just for any of you who might not have an idea how many different kinds of curved blades there are, these are just some of the depictions in art about the curved blades. So you might think that a curved sword is a curved sword is a curved sword. But in fact, there are lots of morphological differences <coughs> in between. So if we look at this example, where this other is standing chatting, he's holding a curved blade. But you can see that the spine is very straight, that it's big, it's a little bit gentleman who's about to sacrifice a slab of meat beside him. You can see, first of all, that his curved sword is much longer, the handle is different, but you can also see that the spine is more curved and that the belly of the blade has this beautiful S shape as well. So, although there are many different morphologies of curved blades, all of these different types have been brought together under two terms in most texts, coppice and machiera. And these are just transliterations of the ancient Greek terms kopis and machira. And this is problematic, but this is something that I'm going to get to in a little while. So, although the first thing that might come to mind when you think about swords and blades is warfare, combat, maiming people, killing people, in fact, the curved sword was not just good for killing your enemy, it was also good for making a sacrifice. So here we have two warriors. And it was also good for chopping at a pig, as in the bottom left hand example, so you could use it for hunting. And if you're Achilles, then you can hold your curved knife and you can get ready to chop the piece of meat that you have in your other hand. So it's not just good for warfare. So preconceptions are important to note, especially in relation to this study of the curved blades, because various authors' preconceptions have largely shaped the information available as opposed to the actual evidence shaping the information that's out there. And I don't find, I'm not critical, because I don't exclude myself from this. When I first started the PhD, this was my preconception about what I would be doing for the next four to five years. So I would be getting to chop to tiny mats, I would chop water bottles, I would reenact vase scenes with my friends in the comfort of the postgraduate room. And I would generally do this cool Xena warrior princess character. But, of course, it became quite clear, fairly quickly, thankfully, that I couldn't just spend four to five years chopping things. But out of my preconception came something very valuable, and this was that I stopped treating the swords that I was looking at simply as artifacts in a museum, something to be studied through the glass. I started realizing that these curved swords were used for killing people, for maiming people, and the curved knives were used for doing things. So they stopped being just artifacts to me. So out of my preconception came something quite valuable. So once I realized that I couldn't unfortunately just play with swords for the next four years, I started looking at the perceptions out there, the information. And it quickly became really clear that there wasn't actually that much information out there. We all know there's lots of books on Greek arms and armor. That's obvious. If you're in the British school, the American school, the Canadian Institute, you're going to find a lot of general books on Greek arms and armor. But what you find is that the same stuff is mentioned in most books. And just to give you an example of this, Anthony Snodgrass wrote the seminal work, Greek arms and armor. And it's the Bible for anyone who's studying this kind of thing. 
but in his fantastic book, he dedicates just over a paragraph to the current source, and he doesn't mention the current knights at all. Now, this is less than the acknowledgement section, so you can imagine if this is the seminal work for Greek arms and armor, what the other books are like. And what I found was not just that there was a small amount of information, but that nothing new, there was no new information. So you were seeing the same vase, the same quotes from Xenophon, and the same sword being introduced in all of the literature. And it got me to wondering, so what else was actually out there? There couldn't be just that small amount of information there. So there are some people who are doing interesting things with curved blades. There's a Spanish archaeologist, Fernando Pizarzans, who's doing great things with the Iberian curved sword, the Espada Falcata. But unfortunately, a lot of his work has not been translated into English. It's difficult to get a hold of. It's very expensive. So his work isn't yet fully in the public domain, which is a shame, because he's done fantastic work. But about six months ago, I had the pleasure of being introduced to an archaeologist called Marek Bursik. And he had done for his PhD a little work on the curved swords, the preserved examples. And so he's going to be publishing his work within the next year. And of course, I'll be finishing. So my hope is that within the next year or two, that there will be new information starting to come out. And that we don't, won't just be looking at the same vases, at the same preserved examples and the same quotes. So based on the very limited amount of information that was out there, there were a few things that immediately became apparent. First of all, that the curved blades were being viewed as unfavorable, as barbarian weapons, or specifically that they were being used by the Persians. And what was also clear was that the curved blades being used by Greeks or in contexts other than warfare, these things were not being taken so this is what I'm really interested in. And in order to start looking at the idea that the curved blades were unfavorable, I started looking at all of the evidence. So preserved examples, the ethnography, and the literature. And to answer my question as to why these curved blades were seen as unfavorable, I started asking several questions. So when I'm looking at the iconography and the literature, I was looking at the bearer. Who is the wielder of the curved blade? Is it a Persian? Is it a Greek? Who is it? And what are they doing? What's their profession? So is it a butcher? Is it a fish seller? Is it a warrior? And then I was looking at the overall context of the scene. So is it a combat scene, a sacrificial scene? And then at the technique and the wounds. So are the wounds that are inflicted by the curved blades worse in some way than those that are inflicted by the straight blades? And to answer these properly, I didn't want to do what other people have done and just pick and choose the evidence. I wanted to look at all of the evidence. And this is what I call my inclusive methodology. So to me, this was really important because what I found was that evidence based on one class and just the literature, the iconography, or the preserved examples, or even just on a small part of one of those classes, this did not provide you with an accurate picture. And one of the greatest things to come from my research is that there is now so much information available. So I have all of the iconographic evidence, all of the literary evidence, and all of the preserved examples in one place. And hopefully these will be published soon and made widely available. So this is really just the beginning of something exciting, the beginning of seeing new information coming out. So when I talk about my inclusive methodology, this is what I mean. So I gave equal weight <coughs> to the three classes. I gave equal weight to the preserved examples, the iconographic evidence, and the literary evidence. The archaeological survey proved to be the most challenging. And this was simply, as I mentioned, that most often you see the same sword being represented in books on Greek armor and weapons. And this is the curved sword that's in the Athens Archaeological Museum here from the Donna. But I was really, really lucky because I met the archaeologist Marek Versic, who had done so much great work on the preserved examples. And when we got 